Hello, my name is Marco Keba, and we are at TTK Agile Day 2012, and one of the people helping us out in the conference is Jon Jäger. Hello, Jon. Hello. Jon, uh, you were working with some of our technical staff on the Cyber Dojo, and you were presenting the principles of improvement to the staff. So maybe to start the whole conversation off, could you please introduce yourself for the ones that do not know who you are? Sure. Um, my name is John Jagger, and I'm a self-employed software consultant, trainer, coach, whatever the latest buzzword is, kind of thing. Uh, based in the UK, in the Southwest, and I do a lot of work in the UK, but also a lot of work in Europe as well. Okay. So, what is actually Cyber Dojo, or uh, Coding Dojo in particular? Why is that a um, learning tool? W what actually happens there? Well, Coding Dojo is simply the dojo in the Japanese sense of the word. It's a place, dojo means a place where people practice. So, a Coding Dojo is a place where programmers practice programming. And the crucial point is that when you're doing the proper practice, true practice, you're not doing it in the sense that you also have to ship the thing that you're practicing. Yeah, so that's what a coding dojo is, and uh, three years ago or so, I was doing a coding dojo in a pub in Oslo, and a couple of the groups wasted more than half of the session trying to install a compiler and a unit test framework for the language that they were supposedly using during that session, that that coding dojo. So in the hotel in the evening afterwards, I was thinking about sort of doing a retrospective in my head. I was thinking about how could you solve that problem, what's the minimum install that you would need to do a coding dojo as a participant. And I realized it was nothing, because you could do it all in a browser, and you could edit and code in the browser and send the, the tests and the code to a server, and the server would run your tests and return the output to you, and that may, you would need to have a browser, obviously, but that's something everyone has already. So that was the genesis of the idea. So Cyber Dojo is a, a website that I've built that is a server that allows you to actually code in a browser in a test-driven fashion. And it was built to allow coding practice at the team level. Okay, so what you're actually saying is that a developer does need to practice. It's not just the shippable code he needs to work on and that's all he needs to do. He needs to practice as an athlete? It depends if you want to get improvement. All the evidence is that if you want people to improve, they have to practice what they're doing. Okay. And you can't, if you think you can practice what you're doing as you're doing your actual paid work, as it were, in terms of a task that's part of the deliverable that's going to be shipped, no, that isn't practice because you're thinking about finishing that thing, not about improving your technique. True. Okay, a couple of times I've uh, heard you mentioning adaptability as being uh, maybe, so to say, a true heart of, of Agile. And... Um, actually being one of the words that were in the finals of Agile, being called Agile. In the and manifesto sense, yeah. yes. Yeah. And uh, why is adaptability so relevant? Why is that even more relevant than the agility, as you say? Well, they're, the, they're, they're very similar if you take agility not in the sense of speed, but agility in the sense of being able to change direction quickly. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the basic idea is that ultimately risk management that change is happening more and more quickly and unless you are focused on that idea of being able to change and respond quickly, the likelihood is you're going to suffer in terms of business. It's as, uh, it's as simple as that really. Okay. The pace of change is quickening. Like I mentioned in the presentation today, the average lifespan of a company is going down and the average lifespan of a human being is going up and we're now at the point where the, the, the uh, average life of a company is half of the average life of a human being. So you're more likely to outlive your company. So companies have to learn how just to survive. Yeah, that sounds a bit scary, you know. You get employed and you're not gonna be safe for the rest of your life. Absolutely, so the days when you could think about joining a company and you were guaranteed that company was gonna survive for your lifetime are gone. Yeah. Okay, so we need to do something in order to... Yeah, both individually up, and... Uh, survive. Yeah. Okay, and uh, these days uh, there seem to be a lot of talk on, um, or a lot of focus on the process, and you know how when when we communicate the organizational stuff, uh, and somehow um, how we code and test seem to be 
second level priority in the whole agility. Is that so right. and why is that so? Well, the way I see it historically is it sort of come in waves. So there was a period when, for example, XP was in vogue and there was a strong focus on improving the technical practice. But then there was a wave after that where Scrum sort of gained some, some, uh, some traction and that was a set of management practices. And what I'm waiting for is a sort of coherent methodology which combines the two. I think that may be a sign that the industry started to mature and we're not sort of violently swinging from one reaction to the other and saying, no, we need a management set of solutions or then we need a set of technical solutions. The fact that those two seem to be disparate methodology seems to me just a reflection of the fact that there's a lack of communication in many situations. Okay, and then, so to say, when you look at the 2000s, last maybe 10 or 12 years, right. it seems that XP has been staying on the levels it was in the, like, 10 years ago, and Scrum seems to be picking up really fast, and the number of teams that are using it uh, seems to be picking up. Is that because the management is choosing the method for their troops? I think I would agree with you in terms of that observation. And yes, Scrum is a set of management practices and so management hook onto it much more. Management don't hook onto XP typically, it's the developers that hook onto XP. So arguably that's one of the reasons it gained, it gained traction. Yeah. And what would you say that the relevance of the XP technical practices and uh, are in a successful team no matter whether it's doing Scrum or Kanban, some sort of iterative development? What yeah. is the relevance of using the XP technical practices in it to make it a successful one? To improve the quality, simple as that, really. Yeah. I mean, Kanban, for example, talks about flow, and stuff that has a higher quality flows through a system more quickly. And again, in terms of being, uh, being agile, there is a sense that you do pick up speed, stuff does go through the pipeline more quickly, and to sustain that, you need to increase your quality. And uh, what would you say, how does uh, a developer improve at best? What, is, what does uh, just Joe, the regular developer, do, do to improve as much as he can, apart from actually practicing the skills of development? Well, just doing any practicing would be an improvement on what I see in my travels, to be honest. Most companies have no time budgeted at all for anything other than stuff that's directly related to the delivery of stuff that ultimately pays the bills. So doing any practice would be, an, would be an improvement. Okay, and by not doing the practice because they don't have time, that means that investing in just pure production and, and work as it is, right. is somehow... Short-sighted. Yeah, Absolutely. short-sighted. It reminds me of the old phrase, we've never got time to do it right, but we've always got time to do it twice. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, an additional question. Uh, Agile seems uh, somehow to be connected with freedom at least, uh, that's the way a lot of the troops understand it and uh, um, the freedom seems to go uh, very far sometimes as being understood as anarchy or there is no discipline at all in Agile right. and uh, what would you say, how much discipline is needed in Agile? I mean is the XP discipline something that is extreme and only XP is extreme, the rest of it is anarchic or what is actually the truth? I mean, to do any engineering in your discipline, it's as simple as that. Uh, I think it's true to say that if you read XP edition 1 versus XP edition 2, there was a change in emphasis and, and tone in those two editions. But if you read XP 1, edition 1, there was a very definite sense that you had to do all of the practices. There was no choice about that. You could not do some of the practices in XP, but if you didn't do some of them, as far as Kent Beck was concerned, you weren't doing XP. And I agree with you, sometimes people sort of use Agile as an excuse for not having discipline and you get a chaotic development environment which is not, not a good way to be working. But to be really Agile and to be disciplined are not orthogonal to each other, they go hand in hand. And again, people don't necessarily understand that. Okay. And uh, what would you say uh, about the level of cross-functionality in a team? What is uh, the right level? Of is it really uh, the width of a person knowing the different phases uh, that should be focused on or is the depth in a particular phase more important? Is there a ratio that would somehow fit as the perfect one? Well, if there is, I don't know what it is. 
<laughs> um, but to, to, in terms of what I generally see on my travels, you c it's almost unavoidable to have people who have deep expertise in the particular thing that they do day in, day out, day in, day out. Uh, what's, what's missing in most cultures and environments and companies is communication horizontally between people with different disciplines and connecting up those different sort of vertical separation so that they become one unified whole with communication so that you get feedback occurring within that and you get the possibility of doing good work at the team level. So in that sense, what's lacking most is, is not expertise sort of that way, but communication, horizontal communication. Which I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, being a, a coach and a consultant, uh, what you are, You've probably visited a number of companies and seeing how they actually understand agility and being agile means to them. And uh, based on your own experience, what would you say the biggest mistakes or the most usual mistakes companies do in trying to adopt agile? The biggest mistake, I would say, is when the, the chiefs, as opposed to the Indians, decide on a particular a change management situation that they impose from on high on the, on the Indians below and there's no buy-in from the Indians and what, however good the merits or not of that particular change transition it's never going to work because it had no buy-in from the bottom yeah so it reminds me of um, something from Jerry Weinberg it's called the, uh, the Buffalo Bridle if you think about Buffalo is a very, very large animal. How would you keep them in a pen? You know, if you've got a field, how would you keep them in that field? You'd, have to put, you'd think you'd have to put very high fences around the edges of the field to keep them in place so that they don't wander off. But in practice, that isn't the case. Buffaloes are so large and so powerful that however big the fences you put up, if they want to go through it, they'll just go through it, right? Yeah. So how do you keep buffaloes in the field? The answer is you have to solve that problem by making the buffaloes want to stay in the field. <laughs> which relates to motivation, obviously. Yeah. So if you want to get some kind of change going within an organization, you first have to want to get the, the developers at the bottom, or the testers, or the salesmen, or whatever it is, the people who actually do the work, to want to do it, to want to make that difference, to want to improve as a culture. Otherwise, you're, you know, you're really fighting an uphill battle. You said that you cannot explicitly motivate an individual. You just create... I think, I think the sense that you can feel that you're an individual powerful enough through your force of your will to motivate someone else is a big mistake. That I don't think that's a helpful way of looking at the problem at all. I think most of the motivation you can give to some other person is through the, the, the words and the actions that you as an individual portray as an example and in the managerial sense, in the sense of shaping the environment that that person works in so that they naturally feel empowered and uh, motivated to do better work. Okay. Okay, maybe to end it all up, uh, would there be any last words or tips for the Croatian Agile community and for the Ericsson Agile community? Uh, the only one that springs to mind is if, if uh, I'm in Croatia Look me up and we'll have a beer together. And if you're in England, look me up and we'll have a beer together. We'll do so. Okay. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks a lot.